This is the Dari and Mel podcast with Dari Noka and Mel Kuyper Jr. The NFL Draft, which is only five days away. Day number one. Night number one in Philadelphia. Museum of Art. Rocky Steps. It's going to be an unbelievable scene. You can get that on ESPN, of course. You can get that on ESPN Radio. Mel will be on the TV side. I will be hosting ESPN Radio's coverage from Philadelphia. All right, we talk so much about these guys, so much about these prospects. You know, draft stock. Where will we see them go? Whose stock is impacted by what? We bring in NFL draft analyst Kevin Weidel, who joins us via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. All right, Kev. Let's go Reuben Foster. Great player for Nick Saban at Alabama. Had the issue at the Combine with the hospital worker. Then news comes out that he's been essentially notified of a positive test because a urine sample obtained at that Combine in Indianapolis was reported as diluted. They're just stacking up against a really talented talented player. What does it do to his stock? I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I think it's a bunch of little things that are starting to pile up and add up to a lot with these teams. Because uh, on the tape, if you just start with a blank canvas for any, any prospect in this class and, and take out positional value and just rate him as a football player, to me, I think he's the best player in this class. I really do when you watch his tape. I'm going to be interested to see where he goes. I, again, if he was clean and there was no you know, concerns off the field, I, think he, I don't think there's a chance he'd make it out of the top five picks this year. I think you could see him slide a little bit, but I, I don't. I, th- I don't think he gets past the mid teens. I think you look at the Philadelphia Eagles at fourteen. I, I think the Indianapolis Colts sitting there with Chris Ballard, and they need so much help on that front seven. We've seen the Chiefs last year take a guy like Chris Jones, uh, Tyreek Hill, maybe some guys with a little bit of character. I think maybe at fifteen could be a landing spot for Foster there. Uh, really help out that Colts front seven. Kevin, it's going to be interesting with Reuben Foster because you have Arizona at 13, Philadelphia, as you said, at 14, Indianapolis at 15, Baltimore at 16, Washington at 17. All would be thrilled if Reuben Foster were there. But if you're picking in the top group, you can't take it. Remember Warren Sapp became a great pick for Tampa Bay. Tyron Matthew became a great pick for Arizona in the third round. So these guys that tend to fall usually tend out to turn out to be pretty good. I want to go to overrated and underrated, Kevin. You watch these guys. You got a guy that you think is way overrated and a guy that you feel can be maybe a second, third round pick or wherever that could be a heck of a lot better than advertised. Well, I'll go with the, uh, the underrated right now. And it's a guy I haven't heard a lot, talked a lot about. It's DeMarcus Walker out of Florida State. And, yeah, he's not the most athletic, gifted guy. But when you watch his tape, Mel, he's, he's so polished uh, just with his hands. And, and one of the things I'm really impressed with, the interior pass rush that he provides mm-hmm. and – this will be a little bit of a term that people might not know. Work in the half man, which is trying to gain leverage on these inside interior offensive linemen. He does a fantastic job of it. One of the most I've seen advanced you know, hand usage uh, on players um, in this class, to be honest with you. Generates a lot of pressure. You watch the Michigan tape at the bowl game all over the field, the Clemson game, and by the way, did not come out for one snap. I think it was 165 total snaps on that tape. He didn't come out for one of them, Mel. So he's a guy that's durable. He's a guy that's got a lot of energy and uh, very productive. I think someone's going to get a really good value for him, whether it be late second, early third round. And the guy that I think is the most overrated is Davis Webb out of Cal. I, I just there's a lot of talk about him. Maybe late first, early second round. Um, he's a guy that, to me, I, I think is a long ways coming away, coming from that Cal system, being ready to play in the NFL. I see the physical tools there, but to me. I just think he's a he's a big time project and, and a guy that I think is just a little bit overrated at this point. I think I see him more of a day three guy than I do late first, early second round. Are pick. you hearing that uh, you know, right now, Kevin? That Davis Webb, quarterback Cal, followed in the footsteps of Jared Goff, formerly of Texas Tech, really came to Cal, basically said, "I'm going to handpick this program to put up big numbers." Do you think Davis Webb could be like some have rumored a late first, early second round pick? I'll be surprised, Mel. If he is, I'll be surprised because I just don't see it. Hmm. Now, it, we don't know what's out there, and it only takes one team to do it to fall in love with him. But to me, I, I would not take him in the first 100 picks. To me, I just think he's a day three guy. I think he's a little bit more of a project. Now, I see the, the height, the arm strength. It's, it's there. I just think it's going to be a big project for him down the road. 
NFL draft analyst Kevin Weidel with us. Darian Mel, ESPN Radio, ESPN app. You talk about Demarcus Walker. It's a good thing that throwing a baseball is not a prerequisite for being a football player. <laughs> oh, God, was that ugly. That doesn't oh, help his cause either. Goodness. In a way too small Jameis Winston jersey, by the way. just Or it looked like a Jameis Winston jersey. But, schmedium. Um, yeah, schmedium. He went schmedium for sure. All right, let's go uh, uh, this Joe Mixon situation here. They you know, He reached a settlement with the victim of the punch in Norman in 2014, that a settlement's been reached. He and her, he says, have, have talked privately. He's glad to put this behind him. Does this, I mean, it doesn't undo the punch. So I think we all need to realize this is a big deal. What do you think, uh, or I should say, where do you think he goes? And does this settlement and having it in some way behind him, I guess, does that impact where he could go? I think the way he's handled the situation um, is going to help him out, Dari. Um, just getting out in front of it, being honest, and, and getting the settlement and apologizing. And, and like you said, you can never take that away, and it's always going to be there. And It's really unacceptable. But I've talked to a lot of people in this in, that I trust in the league that think he's the top running back in this entire class. And uh, I, I tend to agree with them and just in terms of what he brings. Um, just complete package-wise, the size, the ability to contribute in the passing game as a receiving uh, target out of the backfield and flexed out wide. Uh, there's a lot of similarities to me. As I think of Le'Veon Bell as well in, in terms of the patience, um, what he can do. I think the top of the second round, I, I, I just don't see him falling past the second round, sorry, to be honest with you. Um, you know, Maybe the Bengals sitting there at the top. Uh, maybe the Browns sitting there at the top of the second round, uh, potentially Detroit Lions. I think there's a lot of landing spots, and I, I think the way he's handled this and gotten out in front has kind of eased some teams and, and really you know, kind of set him up. And I just think he's too talented, really, to make it past the, to the second round when it's all said and done, Mel. You know, Kev, the other night, Todd, Todd, Todd and I did a first round where we played GM <laughs> teams, and we rolled through the first round. I don't know if you saw it, Kev, but Todd was mocking me. He was being his typical sarcastic self, laughing at me, <laughs> acting like I was reaching for everybody and he was stealing everybody. He, he laughed at Hassan. He laughed when I took Hassan Reddick. He laughed when I took Zach Cunningham. He laughed when I took Demarcus Walker, who you already referenced as a good player. I want to hear about Hassan Reddick and Zach Cunningham. Are you laughing at me for liking those two guys? They're linebackers, one from Temple, Reddick, the other Cunningham from Vanderbilt. I, I like Hassan Reddick. I think he's got a lot of versatility. I think he's a late one. Um, I think he's really helped himself out in the, in the postseason draft process. There's a lot he can, he can do for you in terms of in coverage. Uh, you can rush him off the edge. Uh, I, I really impressed with him at the senior bowl, the off linebacker position, the instincts he showed in the range and, and the, the steadiness in coverage, if you will. Um, Zach Cunningham has a lot of upside. He is long. He is a sideline, sideline defender. I think there's some work with him in terms of instincts. I think he's a little finesse at the point of attack at this point. I think he needs to get stronger. I lean more of a, a late second than I do an early second, late first, if you will, with Zach Cunningham. But I think he's a talented player. I think he's got a lot of upside. I just think he's got some things he's got to work on these first couple years when he gets into the league. Kevin Weidel with us here. Kev, before you go – you, by nature, are a quarterback. I know you watch every position closely, maybe a little bit more with quarterbacks, potentially just because that's the position that you played through college. Rank, if you would rather quickly, the NFL careers of the top four quarterbacks in this draft. Oh, this I hate this question because it all depends on where they end up, sorry. So, but I'll just say this. This is how I feel. I, I would say Watson, Trubisky, Mahomes, Kaiser would be my four right there in that order. In that order. You would go Watson first. Whichever team you were, the first team to draft quarterback, you would take Watson over Trubisky. I just think the intangibles. I I think Mm -hmm. the more I do this and the more I evaluate quarterbacks, the intangibles, the leadership, all those qualities, and the ability to play in the big moments that Watson showed, really I would lean towards that because I don't think there's a, a surefire guy. I think they're all developmental quarterbacks, so I'd rather go with the guy that I've seen play in the big moments and do it on the big stage. Nice job, brother. Thank you much for coming on. You got it. Take care. Thanks, Kev. Easy on McShay this week.
Stefania Bell's NFL Draft Prospect Update. Malik Hooker. Free safety Malik Hooker out of Ohio State didn't work out at the NFL Combine this year because he was recovering from not one, but two different surgeries. Hooker underwent a core muscle repair and a repair of the labrum in his hip. Rehab to regain flexibility and strength, especially of the abdominal and hip muscles, has been Hooker's focus since surgery. So much so that he brought his PT to the combine so he wouldn't miss a beat between meeting teams and doing interviews. It appears to be paying off as the latest reports on Hooker suggest he's on track to participate in training camp with his new team, wherever that may be. It is the Hot List. Hot list. Mikey, see, I didn't mean to come off as unappreciative there. For your efforts of getting money talks. Listen to the beginning of it. Oh, you'll be fired up. Okay. So, three lower seeds with the best shot of a first-round upset. Mel, why don't you give us your number three? My number three would be the Chicago Bulls. Uh, the Celtics, they're an eight seed, the Bulls are. The Celtics have a player in Isaiah Thomas, you all know, probably going to finish in the top five for the MVP award. Better overall team, we clearly know that. But the Bulls have a couple guys with championship rings. They have the best all-around player in the series in Jimmy Butler. If they can find a way, Dari, to win one of the first two games on the road, maybe, just maybe, it's a long series. Who knows? I'll put them at three, the Chicago Bulls. Uh, you and I agree on three. I have the Bulls there as well. Yeah, I don't – You know, should we believe in Boston as the one seed in the East? Probably not. Uh, I read yesterday, and I didn't look this up at any Vegas website, but I read they're actually the third best bet to get to the finals out of the East, despite the fact that they're the one seed, that Cleveland and Toronto both are given better odds of getting to the NBA Finals, despite the fact that Boston is the one. It would be interesting to see Rajon Rondo against his old team, against the Celtics. Jimmy Butler, I think, is a key here. But he's probably going to be really, really well closely defended by guys who are very good defenders. I'm talking Jay Crowder going to get some time on him. Avery Bradley, Marcus Smart. It's going to be a tough run for Butler, but we know the Bulls can defend a little bit too. They're healthy right now with Dwayne Wade being healthy. Jimmy Butler is playing phenomenal basketball. Yeah, I give the Bulls a shot too. So you and I both give them the third best shot of the first round upset. How about your number two? I'm going to go here. This is more of a vote to try to ma- maximize or, or, I guess, motivate, Dari would be the word, a team that I think could go a long way and maybe be a major factor. But you got to get out of that first round. And the Atlanta Hawks are a team that, you know, like I said, this has more to do with not fully trusting Washington, the Wizards, than me saying I'm believing in the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, the Wizards have to show they can do it at money time. And they are a team that could, if they just get, I think, over the hump, if they can just get some confidence and just feel like, okay, we this year are a little different than past years, we can do some serious damage, especially with the Cavaliers playing no defense. And this Wizards team has a terrific backcourt with John Wall and Bradley Beal, Gortat, quality center. The X factor is Otto Porter Jr. If the Wizards play their potential, sorry, this will be over in five games. But can they? Okay, that's far from a given. The Hawks, they got a, a really good player, Schroeder, coming up his best year as a pro. If he holds his own in the backcourt, I think the veterans in the front court, which is Millsap and Dwight Howard, they're maybe capable, if the Wizards are still kind of wondering about where they are, maybe Atlanta is capable of getting this to a seventh game. So if the Wizards play their full potential, it's over in five. Yeah. If this is the Wizards again, typical Wizards, then maybe Atlanta can stretch it a little deeper than that. Let me reiterate to people, you and I have no idea what our lists are. No. But we agree on number two as well. I have Atlanta as the second best shot at the upset. If you want to just, and I think because they're Atlanta and they're typically always under the radar, even a couple of years ago when they won 60 games in the regular season and kind of flamed out in the playoffs, nobody pays a lot of attention to what they do. They did win four of their last five. That includes a win over Boston and two over Cleveland. They are playing good basketball right now. And I think Washington's got a little bit of a challenge in guarding Dwight Howard because it doesn't look like Jan Mahinmi, who's, what, a 6'11", seven, 7-footer, seven is going to be available for them at least early in the series. And if that's changed, I apologize, I haven't seen a difference in that story. Then I, I think Atlanta does have a shot for all the reasons that you gave, so I won't waste any more time on that. I want to try something here at one. I, I, I want to see if we agree. I'm going to go first on this one. I don't want anybody to think I'm copying you, okay? You ready? I'm ready, Coach. My best shot for a lower seed 
to pull the upset is the Utah Jazz. Facing ding, ding, that. Ding, 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 Seriously? Ding. We agree on all three? 1,000%. How about it? Yeah, that, that, first of all, this is the end of the road for the Clippers as we know them. Blake Griffin can be a free agent. Chris Paul, a free agent. They're not going to look the same. They've really uh, had very little playoff success in the way that that team has been constructed for the last half decade or so. There's no reason to think it's any different. I think Utah play, Utah's the best defensive team in the league. They play at a very slow pace. They can control the pace. They can impact what the Clippers want to do offensively. I don't know how confident a team the Clippers are, but I know that Utah is a team that is very good, built for now, really built for the future. What Quinn Snyder has done with the Jazz, I think, is really impressive. They've got a good mix of youth and veteran leadership. Uh, Gordon Hayward is going to be a free agent and very highly paid at the end of the year. He has a lot to prove, though, in the postseason. I think he could be a superstar in this postseason. I like Utah to beat the Clippers. Yeah, I mean, identical. I mean, you think about Utah. I mean, with Chris Paul and Blake Griffin, uh, you know, for the Clippers, you got to be concerned. I mean, they're the more talented team. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but Utah, Dari, uh, you look at them, they frustrate their opponents with their defense. Uh, during the regular season, they were second in field goal percentage defense. Gordon Hayward's having a very good year. Uh, he'll be one of the more coveted free agents probably this summer. Uh, Gobert gives them a very good rim protector, a very good rebounder. Key guy for me, George Hill, the point guard. Mm-hmm. Their second league score. They need him to come up big on the offensive end. If he does, you, know, you look at it and you say, okay, Chris Paul, Griffin, the more talented team, are the Clippers. But Utah, something about them, Dari, gives me a feeling that they can win this series. So I would put Utah, the Jazz, at number one. I, I saw them early in the season mm-hmm. here in Charlotte, took Nick to the game, and uh, I was really impressed with him. I was really I, – I thought that – it was. A, I didn't know that they'd be a 50-win team, but you can see the direction that they're going. Again, the mix of veterans and youth. They've got to keep Gordon Hayward. He's huge. He's immensely popular in Utah. He's immensely popular with the team. It's a team that, that I, what I noticed about him was great. They trailed almost that entire game. Was great, and they came back and won. Great body language. Uh, they... they I think if you watch them, and I realize a lot of people have not seen the Jazz this season. They don't get a lot of the primetime ESPN, TNT type of slots. Watch them. I think that you're going to be really, really impressed with the Jazz. Well, when you look at uh, Roy Dari, and I think that's the whole thing. We always talk about, you don't go by anything but matchups. How do teams match up? And I think when you look at this, from a team matchup standpoint, contrasting styles of the Clippers and Utah Jazz make it that much more interesting. Uh, it's a toss-up, and it's going to be a fun series to watch. Uh, and I think on anybody's list, when you talk about the, the lower seed that could win, I think you would probably say this is the obvious one. Is there another one, Dar? Who was it for for you? I, you know what? I, <laughs> I considered mm-hmm. Milwaukee. I'm really interested. Like, I don't give Memphis a shot. I don't give my Thunder a shot. I don't give Portland a shot. You've been on Milwaukee all year. I, I've been on Milwaukee a couple of years. I remember, was it two years ago or was it last year? Two years ago. I picked them to beat the Bulls in a playoff series, and they took them to six. Mm-hmm. Um, I, like, I've been an Antetokounmpo fan for a long time. I saw him as a rookie twice here uh, in person. I love his length. I love his athleticism. I think he's a guy that on a great stage like we've got, and, and, and we're going to get to see him today, 5.30 Eastern on ESPN, the Greek freak. This will be his first playoff game. It's a team that causes a lot of problems because there's a lot of Antetokounmpo's. When you're looking at a guy, for instance, like Chris Middleton as well, they've got a lot of length. They're athletic. They're not always the most disciplined team. And they don't necessarily have, and, and Ted Acumpo is kind of becoming this guy, but the obvious go-to guy that with a ball in his hand in big moments, I like Toronto a lot, so I'm, I'm hesitant to pick the Bucks, But I do think the Bucks are a very explosive team. And, Mel, over the last, uh, well, post-All-Star break, they had the second-best record in the East. I think they were 17-6. and six. So I think Milwaukee's a team to pay attention to. I just think Toronto's a little bit too good. All right, would you have taken Memphis with a healthy Tony Allen and given them a shot over San Antonio? No, I, I could see the Spurs winning that one in right, four. So or now five. you're ready to admit that I didn't gag it on Memphis. No, no, I'm not going Memphis. You're I'm not. Staying. You're not going. You're, no. you're not going to give me that credit. You're not going to give me that. Hey. that I actually, when all was said and done, your comment about me gagging it on Memphis was not inaccurate. I said that you gagged it because you said that they were 
Um, Disappointing team. But they were still 10 games over 500 when you said that. I, had, I was all. saying what I had seen up until that <laughs> point was disappointing. What happened after that, Dari? I don't remember. Stefania Bell's NFL Draft Prospect Update. Jake Butt. Michigan tight end Jake Butt tore his right ACL in this year's Orange Bowl and underwent reconstructive surgery shortly afterward. This was not Butt's first ACL injury. He actually tore his ACL and meniscus in 2014. From his perspective, this recovery has actually been easier since he didn't have early weight-bearing restrictions as this was just an isolated ACL injury. While recovery and return to play can vary following ACL surgery, on average, an NFL player returns within about eight to nine months, but who appears to be on track with his rehab will continue to be brought along gradually with whatever team selects him in this year's draft. Stefania Bell's NFL Draft Prospect Update, Sidney Jones. One of the top cornerbacks talent-wise in this year's draft, Sidney Jones, out of University of Washington, will have to delay the start of his NFL career after tearing his Achilles at his pro day, March 11th. Jones underwent surgery with Dr. Robert Anderson from Ortho Carolina shortly afterward and is facing roughly a six-month recovery window. His range of motion will be limited early on while the repair heals, then gradually he'll be able to increase his activity, typically running at a about four months and adding football activity slowly after that. The biggest challenge for Jones after this type of injury will be regaining the speed and explosiveness demanded by his position, which for many athletes can take up to a full year. He should absolutely make a full recovery, but whether the team that selects Jones has him on the field this fall remains to be seen. I look over your Mach 4.0, I look over Todd, 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 Todd's Mach uh-huh. 4.0 as well, and I'm always just kind of curious, you know, I mean, in terms of what you're hearing and, and, and why, for instance, there are big differences. Right. Like, you don't think Jacksonville takes Leonard Fournette. He does think Jacksonville takes no, Leonard No, no, no. Basically, it gets down to who's available right. and which you are hearing. At that point, you know, you got Jonathan Allen. Somebody's going to drop, okay, though. Okay. Somebody's going to drop. Solomon Thomas, when we did ours, dropped all the way to seven to the Chargers, and I took him. Remember, Leonard Williams dropped to six to the Jets, and the Jets took him. Somebody's going to fall a little bit. And Rich Semini said the Jets are hoping that uh, Jamal Adams drops down there, the safety from LSU. So that's what you hope to have happen. And I, somebody's going to drop just a little further. Now we take Reuben Foster out of there. You push him down to the middle of the first. Uh, you know, Todd took with San Francisco's second pick. Todd took Marshawn Lattimore at two, which was a surprise to yeah. me. That impacted Tennessee. So Tennessee, I took Foster. Well, Foster's going to drop a little bit. So you know, when you have a, a, a surprise pick, it impacts everything. And one of the players we discuss as a top four pick is going to go 6-7. And like I said, in this particular market with Solomon Thomas, in terms of Fournette, Fournette sounds good. But when we talked earlier to, to Mike Duraco, he said that offensive line's not improved. They haven't done a lot to help the offensive line. That offensive line was horrible. They could not run the football, he said, the last five years. Okay, And T.J. Yeldon had a pretty good rookie year, did nothing last year. So that offensive line is a big issue. You bring in Fournette without bolstering the line. And this line is not going to bring you a lot in the draft. I mean, if you think this draft is going to help your offensive line dramatically, and they were talking about maybe moving down and getting Cam Robinson, which means they wouldn't get Fournette. Uh, I don't care however which way you want to slice it. Their offensive line was so bad and is so bad that Fournette behind that line ain't going to run for a lot of yards, Dari. You're right, I mean, and that's true. And I had Fournette as a big instant impact guy, and, and you know I'd like to think that he won't go there and that he does end up here in mm-hmm. Carolina. Which would be great. When you look at the quarterbacks, again, you and Todd, a little bit different there. Uh, your first, first quarterback to go is Trubisky. His is Watson. Uh, you know, does it in, in this case, do you believe Trubisky will be the first, or does it depend on the team that decides to take a quarterback first when you are slotting this in your mock draft? And I'm not talking about mm-hmm. necessarily what you and Todd did the other day where no. – you go head to head, head to head, but I'm talking about you place your own 4.0, and then so does he. Yeah, I would say right now it would be Trubisky. I wouldn't say guaranteed because you never know what 32 teams are thinking, but the consensus is that Trubisky is going to be the first quarterback taken. Watson, the accuracy issue was there. Accuracy from the pocket was the reason why, or lack of, I should say, is the reason why he didn't win a Heisman Trophy, and the reason why he had a third, second-round grade going into the latter portion of the season. He made his statement at the big spot against Alabama, the big game. Is that enough 
to move you all the way up. Uh, Trubisky's got issues with the 13 starts, and, and he got lack of some consistency and some games throwing the football. And he did not play well against Stanford in the finale, in the Sun Bowl. I think when you look at Patrick Mahomes, that's the guy that everybody's talking up. That's the red-hot prospect at any position, and I think his deep throwing ability is the reason, Dari. I've said all along, this is a bubble green league. That's what college football is. It's short passes. It's basically glorified handoffs to improve your stats and make your your your, your sheet look good in terms of completion percentage and all that, which in the NFL doesn't translate because these guys got to throw into tight windows, and they don't have a clue how to do it. They've never had to do it. So this kid is able to throw into tight windows. Sometimes he tries a little too hard to do it, but I like that. And I think, uh, you know, you can't you can't make plays unless you throw the ball down the field. You can't, yeah, you know, you're going to have a few interceptions now and then. I, I don't worry as much about that. I don't like guys that just will never, Kaiser, Deshaun Kaiser, Notre Dame. Yeah, you know, he holds the ball way too long. He won't pull the trigger when he has to. Well, this guy... Mahomes will pull the trigger. And we talked to him, Dari. We love his confidence. Uh, when he was up in Bristol, I told a couple of people he wowed over with his personality and the way he handled himself. So I think Patrick Mahomes doesn't get out of the middle portion of round one. All right, finally, who is the player more than any other mm-hmm. that you – disagree the most with Todd about, whether it's for Jabril the good Peppers. or for the bad. Jabril, Jabril Peppers, no doubt. He, he doesn't think Peppers should be a first-round pick. Uh, I look at him as a football player. Find a spot. Find his niche. It's going to be safety. Forget linebacker. It's going to be a safety spot. He played the slot corner as a, as a, uh, third, as a sophomore. Last year, as a third-year sophomore, he played uh, you know, a linebacker position. So he had 13 tackles for loss and three or four sacks. He's only had one career interception. I get that because he didn't have a ton of opportunities to pick off passes. So once he gets more opportunities, I think that number will increase. But Jabril Peppers is a football player, and that's all you want, a big-time player. And I think he goes in the first round. Todd doesn't think he's the one. Todd laughed when I took Zach Cunningham from Vanderbilt. I like Zach Cunningham. John Gruden, when I was with John, said, hey, you love, you don't find tall inside linebackers with length. And this guy has that, and that's a tough go for a quarterback when you got an inside linebacker in the middle of the field with that kind of height can really dis- disrupt the quarterback and his ability to hit those throwing lanes. So uh, Todd laughed when I took Cunningham. Kevin Weidel said he liked him in a second. We'll see. That was another player that we had a disagreement on. Stefania Bell's NFL Draft Prospect Update, Tack McKinley. UCLA linebacker Tack McKinley underwent shoulder surgery in March to repair a torn labrum, which carries a four- to six-month recovery window. McKinley is one of a couple athletes who opted to have surgery after the NFL Combine, perhaps in part to avoid a scenario like that of defensive end Shaq Lawson, who drafted by the Bills last year, chose not to have surgery, had a setback in minicamp, and was out the first six weeks of the season. The addition of six weeks recovery on the front end for McKinley means he should be increasing his activity during training camp with the possibility of being ready to play at or near the start of the season. We bring in NFL insider and NBA sideline reporter Adam Schefter who joins us right now. Shell Pennzoil performance line and of course Schefter we're going to get into the NFL and what you're hearing as the draft approaches about spots and Joe Mixon and Reuben Foster and some of the interesting names, but you were on the sideline working that game last night. How much has the Rondo injury impacted this series? It's a totally different team. It's a totally different game last night, and it's a totally different series due to his absence. I think he had five DMP CDs this year, did not play coach's decision, and now he's going to have a bunch of DMPs DMPCDs with Chicago's disappointment. Like this guy, who at one point was ready to be run out of the city, has become this vital cog that I don't know that they're going to be able to win without. Because, as the great Hubie Brown pointed out last night, without him, they lose all different kinds of dimensions. The pace of the game changes entirely. So rebounds that Rondo was getting and starting fast breaks, steals he was getting and starting fast breaks, pace of game, all is totally different without him. It's just entirely different. And last night, they didn't have a single assist in the third quarter. Not one. They had one in the first quarter. When you're getting one assist in the first quarter, zero in the third when you're trying to make up ground on the Celtics, that's awfully difficult to do. And so... As good as Jimmy Butler and Dwayne Wade are, as great as Robin Lopez has been in this series, as much flash as Miritich and Bobby Portis has 
shown, I mean, just from my perspective, that's a different team, and it's going to be a different outcome without them. Adam, all I can say is you're amazing, pal. Because uh, you know, we got we got days till the draft. We're doing a, we're doing our mock first round, Todd and I. And I'm, we're doing stuff. I look over at the set, and I see I see Adam talking to an NFL GM probably at the time. And now you're doing <laughs> NBA. You're getting massage therapy. You're doing NBA. You got the draft. Come. Adam, how do you fit all this into a day, pal? And how did this NBA thing even get going? Well, before we get to that, Mel, did Todd tell you about his massage therapy? Did he tell you about it? I did not get the report yet, no. Well, he texted me on Thursday night as I was coming home. He said, that is the single best recommendation I've received in my life. Really? <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay. That's all I'm going to say to you. So you, you hey, to hey sorry. Adam has been talking about this for weeks now. Really? That we all should get massage therapy. I- I've never had a professional massage in my life, and I'm 40 years old. I hate to say that. Well, I, well, listen, uh, you know, as a married guy with kids, I, I never have time. Never, never, right? So I was up in Bristol, and one of the, one of the people there said, oh, I, there's a woman here in Bristol that does some massages, and you should try her. And I tried it. I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm, I told Todd and Mel, and I was like, well, I don't do that. I just... <laughs> well, M- M- Mel has no and, uh, stress <laughs> in his life, though. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Todd, Todd got his first massage in Bristol on Thursday night, and the text, I can actually read it to you. Um, <laughs> I was driving home on Thursday night. I get a text from Todd, and uh, and then we're going to the basketball story. I'm sorry to delay. Just he says to me, uh, "Where is it?" No, this is uh, worth it. No, we're good, man. We're on your clock now. We're, we're, this is good. Here, yeah, yeah. Sorry, but okay. Here he goes. He says, "He says I've never had a better recommendation in my life!" Exclamation point. Thank you! Exclamation point. So, for, <laughs> wow. I'm just telling you, it was it, it's fantastic. So. If McShay feels especially rejuvenated over this next week, Mel, you'll know why. And you know there's a secret, and you'll know what you have to do next year to get ready for the 2018 draft. But I digress. The basketball thing is something that came about. ESPN knows over the last few years I just started playing in a fancy basketball league, and I, I really didn't pay much attention to the NBA at all. And it became sort of like my hobby. And through the course of that league, I just got to know the NBA, never really – I paid attention to it since I was in high school, uh, probably. And I became very intrigued by the whole thing. Really began tracking it, knew the players on the teams. I could tell you rosters 10 deep on any team in the league. And so they said to me, we're given interest in doing, not because they needed it, just as like a fun kind of thing, any NBA sideline reporting. I'm like, oh, that would be unbelievable. Let's try that. And the way I viewed it was just as a professional vacation. And there's, you know, my job, the NFL job, information, news, everything that happens in the NFL is under your watch. To go to an NBA game, I, I, I don't want to say, you know, the pressure's off because there's not. There's pressure to do any job and to do it the right way. But it's just a different experience. And you step out of your comfort zone, which is something you've been doing for 27 years, and you just do something that you haven't mm-hmm. done. It's just, it's just different. And it's refreshing and rejuvenating and you know and it's not like it happens all that much i've done three games so on the occasion you get to do it it's it's really i think quite fun the downside of course is the travel even my daughter on friday morning she called me dad did you come home last night i came home i got home at one in the morning and i left the house at five thirty to go to the airport she she got mad she got mad at me now my eight-year-old daughter that i had told her i was coming home thursday night which i did but it was after she was sleeping and I was gone before she woke up on Friday oh, no. morning. I felt see, bad about hard. that. That's so that's Adam's so going to take her to back be. to see Beauty and the Beast 2, right? At oh, the, by the way, the new Beauty and the Beast, really good. Just for the record. No, I already no, no, no. took her. You've already been there. Opening yeah. weekend. That, 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 that was not good. That was a. That was great. That was yes. a spectacle. It, hey, it was. I Adam, agree. where's Reuben Foster going now, linebacker Thank Alabama? No, I, I think there are still enough teams that like him that I still think – He's off the board by roughly pick 25 or so, but he could not have had a worse experience. He could not have handled himself in a worse way. He could not have done more things to hurt his own draft stock because, you know, I remember talking to the 49ers the night that he was thrown out of the combine, and they were considering him at number two, at number two, because I happened to be standing with them when I got the call that he was thrown out of the combine. 
And when I got the call that he was thrown out of the combine, I started making calls to confirm the information and get an explanation. And, and I, you know, literally, I was standing right by them. They were watching the whole thing. And when I got done, they said, man, we were considering taking that guy at two. So they ain't taking him at two. So that gives you an idea of where he was in play. And now we'll see where he'll actually go. And like I said, my guess is he's, he's up the board somewhere between, let's just say, I don't know, uh, 10 and 25. Mm. Okay. All right. Adam Schefter joining us. Uh, Adam, better shot of it happening. Joe Mixon, a top 25 pick, or somebody other than Cleveland picks one? Joe Mixon, top 25. I don't see Joe Mixon, top 25 pick. Top 25? No. Well. That's not going not gonna to happen. All right. NFL teams not impacted then, in your sense, from his statement yesterday, the meeting with the young lady that he put, all of all of him accepting some form of responsibility. It doesn't take away the action. I fully understand that. I just didn't know how impacted you thought NFL teams might be by it. No, you know, I, I, I'll tell you something personally. I watched that video for the first time, for the very first time last week. I'd never see, I, I didn't want to see it yeah. in a way because I knew once I saw it, I would be furious and my opinion would be tainted on the guy. And so I tried not to watch it. I mean, you know it exists. And, and, and once you watch it, uh, it, it was, you know, it was, it was as disturbing as what I thought it could be. And, and there's no way that if you watch that, that it can't impact the way you feel about where he should go um, or what he's done. I and agree. so to me, you know, I, I, I will say this. He's going to go. And he's going to get drafted, and he's going to get drafted. If I had to guess, he's going to get drafted roughly sometime on day two. I don't know whether that's round two or three, but I'll say this also. There's a lot of teams that will not take that guy. A lot. Mm-hmm. I buy that. A lot. It's a it's a horrific video. and uh, Yeah. Yeah, it, you're right. I love it. We went from... NFL, NBA, massages, reading texts online, all in 10 minutes, Adam. Beauty and the pre- Beast, the whole thing. I mean, Beauty yeah, we, and the we, Beast. We spanned the, ga- we span the gamut today. We did. We did. All while you're wandering around the airport. Go home, see family, go to work, whatever you got to do, but we appreciate your time. <laughs> hey, I look forward to seeing you this week, Mel. Dowry, thanks for having me on. This is Mel's week. This is yep. his week. No, 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 no. Yep. Adam, we'll see you in Philadelphia, pal. Great see job, you, buddy. Bud. Thanks. Look forward to it. Stefania Bell's NFL Draft Prospect Update. Fabian Moreau. UCLA cornerback Fabian Moreau was a prospect on the rise until he tore his left pectoral muscle partway through the bench press at his pro day in March. The very next day, he went to New York City and underwent surgical repair with Dr. Frank Cardasco. Despite the unfortunate timing of Moreau's injury, the recovery period of roughly four to six months allows for the likelihood that he'll be able to participate in training camp. And the good news? There are plenty of NFL players who have had this injury and return to top form, so it should not significantly impact Morrow's draft status. And now, insurance-minded speeches from GEICO. Let's talk about power. To illustrate this, allow me to tell you a story about how I moved a tow truck 25 miles using only my index finger. I was stranded with a flat tire. I opened the GEICO app. Then, with a few taps of my finger, I beckoned emergency roadside assistance and a tow truck to my car. I invite you all to unleash the full potential of your fingertips with the GEICO app. Thank you. Stefania Bell's NFL Draft Prospect Update. John Ross. University of Washington wide receiver John Ross underwent surgery to repair a torn labrum in his shoulder after the NFL Combine, a procedure that typically requires a four- to six-month recovery. For players like Ross with a surgery this recent, medical rechecks don't offer significant updates because it's still so early in the healing process. On the positive side, success following this type of surgery is generally very high. So wherever he gets drafted, Ross will be rehabbed with his new team leading up to training camp with a gradual move towards football activity as he progresses. Really interesting uh, story, though, that's come out over the last couple of days, Mel, with a guy who did not play organized football in high school or in college, but he has signed a deal with the Indianapolis Colts where he will go and play tight end. 
He's out of VCU. Averaged almost 10 points a game last season on the basketball court for a good Rams team. But didn't play football. Stands 6'6", weighs about 260, and an NFL body, so the scouts say. Worked out last month for about 30 of the 32 NFL teams, and now he is a Colt. Not draft eligible this year. He was actually last year. Mo Ali Cox, and he joins us right now via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. A lot of people are going to be watching you closely, uh, no question, to see oh, how's he, he hasn't played football in how long. Let's answer that question. When was the last time you played on an organized football team? Um, my freshman year of high school. Okay, so you did. All right, so take us through that season. What position did you play? How good were you? Um, I played tight end and defensive end, and I was probably one of the best players on the team. All right, so then you pull away from football. Was that just to, to focus on basketball, or was there another reason? Why did you jump out of football um, after ninth grade? My parents had separated, so I moved two years in a row during football season, so I didn't have an opportunity to play. And then I ended up transferring to a private school, which didn't have football, Middleburg Academy out in Middleburg, Virginia. Uh, they didn't have football, so I just had to stay with basketball. It was a small school with only about 200 kids, so I kind of didn't have Room for a football team. Well, let me ask you this, Mo. When did the idea of football get back into your mind? Was it while you were at VCU? Was it something you were thinking about all along? Was it just this year? When was football something that you said, boy, I think I can give this a shot and, and maybe have a chance to have an NFL career? Um, my, my freshman year of college, pretty much, um, my head coach, Saka Smart, and our athletic director, they they knew a football scout, but he had came to one of our shoot-arounds and he had seen me, he was like, boy, you have a football body, and you have the intangibles to go to the next level and play in the NFL if you want to. So that was when it kind of, like, jumped in my mind. And then um, one of our assistant coaches was best friends with Jason Witten, and he came up to visit our coach. But while he was up here, he pretty much – he came to one of our games, and I talked to him, and he pretty much told me the same thing. And then this past year, I mean, scouts have been coming to our practices – Calling our co- calling our coaching staff and all this other stuff, so it's kind of been in the back of my mind for a while. But I just try to focus on basketball as much as possible before I make a decision. Mo Ali Cox, former VCU basketball player, now uh, part of the Indianapolis Colts after reaching a contract agreement and a deal this week to go play tight end for Indianapolis. You worked out for I think thirty of the thirty two teams, Mo Ali. How uh, how much interest was there? I mean. Were the Colts one of multiple offers for you? Yeah, I had multiple offers. Um, pretty much almost every team was at my pro day, which which was kind of surprising <laughs> since I had to play football in so long. But, yeah, there were a bunch of teams interested, so I didn't get a chance to visit every team because we had such a condensed time frame because the draft was coming up because we kind of wanted to make a decision before the draft. But we had multiple offers for teams. And we've seen this. Uh, you go back to Antonio Gates. Everybody tries to find the next Antonio Gates. Well, you think about Tony Gonzalez and Jimmy Graham and Julius Thomas. Right? That was right. The Rico Gathers out of Baylor last year in the sixth round. And I look at your physical ability, your athletic ability. It's six four and a half, six five, two hundred and sixty two pounds, and with incredibly long arms, huge hands. Good speed, incredible athletic ability with a 35 and a half vertical. Uh, you know, Mo, I mean, do you feel like physically, obviously, you're ready? What's going to be the biggest transition? What's the area you have to work on the most moving into the NFL to try to play football for the first time in a long time? I would say just besides learning the playbook and little things like that, just um, my footwork and different technique stuff. I mean, we were going. I was going over my pro day film with um, some tight end coaches when I went to visit their teams. It's just like little stuff, like not bringing my arms back when I'm about to block, and like just um, coming out of my coming, the breaks on my routes, like, um, cutting off and stuff like that. So little things that you can learn, which is coaching over time. This is just things I haven't done in such a long time. It's going to be fun to watch, man. Mo Alley Cox out of VCU, now part of the Indianapolis Colts, signing a deal this week. Uh, hey, good luck. Uh, we're looking forward to this, man. It, you know, we've seen great basketball players. Uh, succeed at that position, Antonio Gates. Uh, we remember uh, Tony Gonzalez is a pretty good basketball player at Cal, too, and we hope the same for you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is the Darian Bell Podcast.